Hi, welcome to BSF. My name is Vicki and today we are going to be looking at 1 Kings 11 through 14. Let's pray and we will dive right into God's word. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this time that we have to sit before your word. Please help us to have ears to hear and eyes to see what we should see. Help us to have hearts that recognize the ways that we are not uh, inclined toward you. Give us courage, Father, to um, respond to your rebuke and correction uh, rightly with repentance. And so, Lord, would you be with me? Please guide and guard my words. I pray that I would not say anything but that which would honor Jesus Christ and him alone. And so, Lord, we uh, pray that this time that we sit before your word would be by your spirit transformative so that all of those who listen, including myself, would be equipped, more equipped, more transformed, um, more Christ-like to live in this world, to bring glory to Jesus and be about your gospel purposes. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So, Christian author C.S. Lewis describes human history as the long, terrible story of man or humanity trying to find something other than God, which will make him happy. He describes uh, us as like a car. He says, God made us, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol and it would not run properly on anything else. Now God designed the human machine to run on himself. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. That is the key to history. Terrific energy is expended. Civilizations are built up, excellent institutions devised, but each time something goes wrong, some fatal flaw always brings the selfish and cruel people to the top and it all slides back into misery and ruin. And so Lewis is suggesting to us a helpful framework, I think, as we enter into King's uh, not only for our study, but also today, uh, suggesting that all human problems, which he lists just an example, money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, all these things and many more can be traced to the idea that God's enemy Satan taught humanity. The idea that they could be like God's, could set up their own as if they had created themselves, be their own masters, invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside God, apart from God. And we'll see this year the biblical book of Kings and our time in the minor prophets and the major prophets depicts such a history, like a magnet that refuses, it's been turned around and it refuses to stick to another magnetic surfaces, we will see the nations Israel and Judah squirming drifting, propelled away from God and away from displaying covenant faithfulness with him. And we're going to start with Solomon, David's son and presumed promised heir uh, that God had promised uh, the, the great son that would come from David's own uh, body in 2 Samuel 7, who would build his house, who would have an eternal kingship. Um, and so from all intents and purposes in the book of Kings going up to 1 Kings 11, where we start, there were hints that maybe this son could be that promised heir. Maybe uh, all the promises and the redemptive plan of of God would take uh, take place and be executed by Solomon. Um, but starting with Solomon, we are going to see another sad and disappointing story. And King's narrator is going to rotate, go through Solomon, and then go through Israel and Judah's kings and their people slowly, looking at um, each of them in turn uh, like diamonds, which catch the light, but due to internal flaws distort, make the light not glorious, but um, broken. Uh, the succession of kings, we will, as we, particularly as we go along, um, will become more and more like we are watching an interstate pileup from which we cannot tear our eyes. King after king, each unique, gifted, fortunate man proves flawed, fallen, 
finite and fragile. And we'll see the kings, including Solomon, expend much energy uh, building this, devising that, but in large and small ways, um, back in using C.S. Lewis's words, they seek to run on the, lo- the wrong juice. They seek to uh, seek happiness, uh, strength, and encouragement, power, direction, um, somehow outside of the good plan that God has and God himself. And so each brings on various kinds of misery and ruin. Um, Yet hope persists. um, This because of God's promise um, that uh, so this is the the glorious ruins of our human condition. Um, We have the, on one hand, the tragedy of human rebellion and sin. Um, Universally, humans bristle under God's good rule. In fact, we doubt that his rule is good. We doubt that he is good. Um, And apart from his intervention, we try all sorts of various ways of living apart from him or taking whatever we is comfortable or we like from God's plans or God's purposes or his character, and then mixing it with whatever um, we like best. So really creating a God um, that we like um, in our image. Uh, But so that is the tragedy. And yet, the hope that persists is in God. God, because he loves us, he intervenes. And uh, the Bible talks about not just here in Kings, but throughout God's grand plan to reclaim this whole world for himself and restore all that sin has corrupted. Sin is a big problem. Our human rebellion has entered the world and death and pain and tragedy have ensued. Um, And that is that big problem needs a big solution. And ultimately, as we learn in the, uh, the New Testament, to reclaim this remnant for himself, God found it necessary to send his only begotten son, Jesus, to enter this world and pay the price for our sin on the cross. It is Jesus who is that ultimate true heir of King David and that promised in whom all promises are fulfilled, including those glorious promises in Second Samuel 7. And so we are entering today that um, with that holding on to that hope, but also wanting to see the tragedy and learn from it. Um, we are going to see the sweep of First Kings 11 to 14. We're going to be going pretty fast, so there's lots of details that we won't get a chance to talk about, but I'm really glad that, and hoping that you will get a chance to flesh that out in your discussion groups or that you have had th- that chance already. And so as we study First Kings 11 to 14, I think that we can learn that God, because he loves us, God pursues us and invites us to turn back to him. Because he loves us, God pursues us and invites us to turn back to him. And so this really uh, sets up the idea, the pattern that we, one of the backbones of Kings, first and second Kings together, which in the Hebrew Bible is one book. Um, Then it the backbone of kings, or one of them, is the pattern of prophecy and fulfillment. The idea that when God's people try to seek happiness outside of him, um, which uh, God's people do repeatedly, God lovingly intervenes, and he sends prophets with promises and warnings. Uh, God's word is trustworthy, and his people should take his warnings and his words seriously. Yet God's heart, some, and we will see throughout Kings, these warnings will get increasingly dire. Um, God's heart is not to punish his people, but rather to prompt them to turn back to him, to abandon all the false ways the, that we have of seeking happiness that will never work. That will only harm us. Um, it's like putting, you know, diesel engine in an engine that is only meant for unleaded uh, petrol. And so, with every prophecy, or with I can say with certainly almost every prophecy, um, there is an implicit invitation for repentance, the call for God's people to turn back to Him, and not just for the characters in King's true story that we're going to read about, but also for us. As readers of God's story, this word, these uh, 
these details, this um, narrative has been preserved for us, for our training, for our warning, and it invites us as God's people in this place and in this time where we are in redemption history, awaiting for Jesus' final return, uh, it invites us to turn from sin and embrace faithfulness to him in every facet of what that means. Um, 1 Kings 11-14, through 14, just our outline, we're going to be going through it in two divisions. It is a passage that has been very carefully structured, but it's difficult to express that linearly. Uh, we're going to do it just then in two broad divisions, uh, chapter 11 and uh, chapter 12 to 14. So chapter 11, we'll see God pursuit of Solomon, calling him for reevaluation of what he loves, and God's pursuit of Jeroboam and Rehoboam in 12 to 14, calling them to reevaluate their patterns. Uh, so let's open up your Bibles if you haven't already done that and turn um, to 1 Kings. Um, again, we're going to, we will be picking up in 1 Kings 11, but I just wanted, because one of the keys to understanding 1 Kings is to understand the idea of prophecy and fulfillment. And so um, we need to hold on to, we're entering the point at fulfillment. Um, evaluation and fulfillment, we need to remember the prophecies that came before that, God's pursuit of his people through prophecy. And um, two in particular are uh, vital for our understanding, 2 Samuel 7 or 1 Samuel uh, Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles 17 um, is another uh, parallel account of this. God promises David a son from his own body would reign forever in justice and righteousness that, uh, so that all of his people would flourish and not be oppressed. Um, so there's many hints that in 1 Kings uh, 1 through 10 that this son could be in fact or is partially um, fulfilled in Solomon. Solomon's name actually uh, is, a, is a pun on the word for Hebrew, shalom, uh, peace, which means in flourishing. Um, he is a king of wisdom. And we saw in chapter three, he initially loved the Lord. He built the temple of God, uh, God's symbolic palace where God's people and all nations could come and know God and worship him and be rightly reconciled to him. And yet, Solomon's reign had conditionality before God. And so this here's the second promise. Um, ex most explicitly, this is uh, it's been mentioned about five times up to this point in Kings, but most explicitly in chapter 9 of 1 Kings. So definitely open your Bible right there. I'm going to read um, 1 Kings 9, uh, 1 or, sorry, 4 through 9. And this is this this is a time when the Lord came appeared to Solomon a second time. Um, Solomon has finished building the house. Um, and so he has made the a long, you know, long prayer and intercession in chapter eight. And the Lord said, well, I'll just read first starting verse three. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built. By putting my name there forever, my eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, so listen up, here's the prophecy fulfillment part for uh, or prophecy part for for conditionality for Solomon if you will walk before me as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness doing according to all that I've commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever as I promised David your father saying you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel but if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them, and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. And Israel be, will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss, and they will say, Why has the Lord done this, thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord, their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. Okay, so that was longer, but it's, I think it's important for us to get our heads around what 
it, what are the conditions for Solomon's kingship before the Lord? Um, and so now let's turn to 11, uh, chapter 11, and we see, as we have looked at even a preview these last few weeks, we've looked at uh, this chapter um, in verses 1 to 8. In light of that prophecy, God's standard for f- covenant faithfulness, um, we see Solomon's failure. He did not follow God. Um, and the problem was just not on the outside, but it was on the inside. It was on the outside. Um, where he uh, worshipped other gods, had other, even like he had built this glorious temple for the Lord. And then right next door, verse 7, he built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem, which I believe we would consider the Mount of Olives. Um, Many of us, if you you know the New Testament uh, geography for Jerusalem. And so, um, yeah, Uh, But the problem especially is Solomon's heart, verse 4, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. So I thought it was good for us to think about, especially with Solomon, uh, our culture, uh, certainly the Western culture that I'm in, uh, in elevates love as one of the highest goods. Um, Love is indeed good because God is loving. In fact, and his love endures forever. And the new, one of the New Testament authors describes, says God is love. Um, But the object of our love matters. How we love matters. Right loves incline our hearts toward the Lord, not away from him. And so on that criteria, we can evaluate Solomon's intense love for his wives, uh, whatever that, um, whatever for whatever reason he pursued that love, it led him away from the Lord, and so it was a false love, not a right love. Um, and going on now, we see so Solomon has violated the terms of uh, his the the conditions that the Lord had very made very clear to him. Um, and the Lord intervenes. He pursues Solomon, not immediately with judgment, but with grace and mercy, um, verses 9 to 13. And so he uh, appeared to him, or at least he said in some way um, to communicate his word. We don't know exactly how, but in verse 11, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all of the kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. And so that's a verbal rebuke that the Lord is making very clear. And there is a prophecy that is now uh, established to what is going to happen, the tearing of the kingdom, which we will see in the next section, chapter 12 to 14. And uh, so my question it, for you to consider and for me, uh, what should Solomon have done? What did God want from him? And the narrator doesn't explicitly tell this, uh, but it Solomon himself has outlined what to do when someone sins. If you think, if you flip back to chapter 8, um, at the prayer of the dedication of the temple, he acknowledges chapter 8, verse 46, um, for there is no one who does not sin. So uh, Solomon acknowledges that universality. There's a real need in the whole t- context of the temple is to allow God's sinful, rebellious, unholy people a way to dwell with their holy God in covenant faithfulness. And so um, the whole context is the idea that um, they would need forgiveness and they would seek it in uh, verse 30. And listen to the plea of your servant the of and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place, the temple. Um, and listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear forgive. And then Solomon goes through many different scenarios of um, what, what should happen when they, f- uh, when, uh, when they have sinned. And 
and even goes on and to say uh, what repentance actually looks like in uh, verse uh, 47, 48, that they acknowledge, they turn their heart in the land which they have been carried and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carry them captive and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you've chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling place, their prayer, that uh, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions they committed against you and grant the compassion in sight of those who carry them captive that they may have compassion on them. Of course, in this scenario, Solomon is not captive. He's sitting pretty, pretty, uh, probably feeling pretty safe in his palace, um, the glorious palace with all of his wives surrounding him and, um, you know, human accolades. Uh, so the, the question is, um, for I think you and for me is to th really think about what Solomon should have done and evaluate what he did do based on the narrative in light of that and what to learn about the Lord. So as far as the narrative goes, Solomon makes zero response. Um, and in fact, uh, verse 14 suggests that Solomon did not respond rightly. He didn't, he just was silent and he didn't hear. He didn't turn his heart back toward the Lord um, because the Lord does something to, which seems to me, I suggest to you, is trying to, uh, in a more uh, severe way or urgent way, get Solomon's attention. Verse 14, the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. Now, of course, earlier um, in chapter 5, verse 4, Solomon himself has said, credited the Lord with the fact that there was peace on all sides, um, that that he wasn't at war. And so now there are there's actually not one adversary had had the Edomite, but God raised up another one in verse 23. Um, and, and all these adversaries are not neutral. They're doing harm. Um, he was an adversary of Israel, that's uh, Rezan of, of Syria, all the days of Solomon, uh, doing harm as Hadad did. And there did did Solomon respond? How do, did he? The narrative is silent. Um, there's a third adversary, and this one is a little closer to home, a little more serious, um, an Israelite from the tribe of Ephraim uh, named Jeroboam, who will become the next king, or who will become the king of the northern tribe um, when the Lord tears the kingdom in two. And so there's a prophecy that's given to him, um, starting at verse 29, um, going to verse 39. And so, um, then we see finally in verse 40, the narrator tells us, what is Solomon's response? Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Um, <clears throat> Solomon makes a physical response, as if that physical problem did not have any spiritual importance. Beware the thought you and I should beware the thought that our physical realities that we're living in this world do not have spiritual importance. I think in modernity, we're uh, often in the habit of, you know, we have so many things. There's so many, so much in prosperity. If my knee hurts, I take an ibuprofen. If I'm hungry, I go to the pantry. Uh, if I, if my car isn't working right, I call the mechanic. Um, or I, I, get the car towed or I take a taxi and I, or an Uber and go to where I need to be. And, uh, but physical problems often have spiritual importance. And so I ask you and I ask myself, um, when things happen physically, it doesn't mean that God is pursuing us in a rebuking sort of way. Um, but when physical problems happen, will you pause this week and pray and ask the Lord, Lord, what what do you intend to teach me through this? What are you doing in this situation where my basement is flooded? Or what are you doing in this situation where I need to work some overtime that was unexpected? Um, Lord, what would you have me do as your servant? And that we practice the dependence uh, of dependence of the Lord in our problems. Okay, um, so moving uh, as we're Moving on, um, this the contrast here. We we see the last three verses sort of summarize Solomon's um, Solomon's reign, and uh, there's a 
contrast here by silence. And uh, what does the narrative show us in contrast? What should, how should Solomon have ended? How should he have ended his reign? Um, there is a kind of king that we need, one whose heart is fully committed to the Lord, one whose ears are fully attentive to the Lord's word. Um, so a principle that I think that we can learn from this section, a takeaway, is that when God rebukes, he desires our repentance. When God rebukes, he desires our repentance. Repentance simply means turning back to God. And um, I think this is illustrated very clearly for us in the biblical book of Jonah. God sent Jonah the prophet to proclaim a word of judgment, God's judgment, against the wicked city of Nineveh, people who did not know the Lord. And so uh, Jonah preached this. He didn't want to go. Uh, he eventually, you know, that's that's another part of the story. The Lord chased him down. And so eventually he went in and he did this very simple, sparse, bare bones uh, kind of prophecy in uh, Jonah 3 verse 4, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And so these, uh, the response of these pagan people who did not have a relationship with God, a covenant relationship with God, did not have his word, did not have the benefits of his temple or the story of uh, the things that God had done. Uh, they believed God, verse five, and they called for a fast and they put on sackcloth the, from the greatest of them to the least of them as a physical outward sign of an internal repentance. And even the king did, uh, verse Verse six, he was not too proud to do that. And in fact, and he commanded everyone in Nineveh to repent. And uh, he calls them, verse eight, to have all call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, verse 10, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. God desires not to punish, not to condemn. He delights, rather, in being able to extend mercy to those who seek repentance and forgiveness. And so, um, who should know God's heart better? God's people. If you have been in, grown up in the church in a place where you know the character of God, um, what should be your response? What should be mine when the Lord brings to our light the fact through the, the Holy Spirit that we have sinned against him in our in what we have done or of what we have left undone in our thought and our words in our attitudes and our actions and Solomon is the, the negative example for us of what we should not do, but rather um, the the, on the other side to say, um, reading, and even if we didn't respond rightly the first time, if we hardened our heart, which is very dangerous, um, do not harden your heart before the Lord. But he, God is gracious and he pursues again. Today is the day for repentance. And so I encourage you and I encourage myself that if if and and actually when, um, because uh, God's people are can be assured that He will um, He will convict them of sin and show them the ways that we are veering away from Him. That uh, with we can pray with God's help that we would respond quickly and rightly um, to turn and not just seek the right behavior, but to seek God Himself and have our heart shaped so that we love Him. Um, so I wonder, have you lately ex heard that from the Lord um, as in a sermon, in s something that your f uh, friend mentioned to you, or just you know in your conscience that um, you are pursuing in some way a wrong path? You are seeking happiness outside of God himself and his covenant faithfulness plan. Uh, what might... Have you experienced your own pushback? Um, what might you be loving that that turns your heart away from God? And the question is, uh, where has God been pulling you? He's already given you the uh, shown you that He's given you the power through His Spirit to repent, to confess sin, 
to confess it and then walk in the power of uh, obedience and righteousness. Um, so I encourage you to think about both sides, the encouragement of how God has already worked in the past, but then take that forward to the place where you are now and say, Lord, please help me to continue to be faithful and to respond rightly to your calls for repentance. God loves us enough to pursue us. He invites us to turn to him. And so let's go to our, our next section uh, briefly. These are wonderful chapters, and our time together will not do justice to them. Verse, or chapters 12 to 14, like chapter 11, these are arranged like a sandwich. So in chapter 11, we had a, a bar, bit about Solomon, then we had a bit about Jeroboam, and then finished with a bit about Solomon. And so in 12 to 14, 12 to 14 we also have um, that same pattern of the house of David, uh, Rehoboam, Jeroboam in the middle, and then Rehoboam at the end. So sort of a, a Rehoboam-Jeroboam sandwich for both of these sections. Um, and so, but we see that in these chapters that God's pursuit, his loving pursuit, cause, calls for us to reevaluate our patterns, the patterns that we set and the patterns that we follow. And so um, these, both of these men, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, largely failed to reevaluate their patterns despite God's pursuit of them. Um, Rehoboam had wrong desires. We see in the first section uh, that in the tearing of the kingdom, verses uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 24, that Rehoboam wanted power. He did not want to be the kind of servant king that um, the, the wise elders uh, counseled him to be. Um, let's see here, where's that verse? Uh, verse 7, remember, and so the, the people um, had come to him. He was at Shechem to be anointed king, and the people said, please, uh, verse 4, your father, meaning Solomon, made our yoke heavy. Um, now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. So there's some uh, little hard implications there of where Solomon is cast in sort of a pharaoh model. Um, and so showing us there were other things wrong that happened, probably because uh, Solomon was not faithful in his heart to the Lord. And so um, Rehoboam gets, of course, wise counsel, and then he also gets um, the counsel of old or wise men, and then also younger men who he was peers with. But the, the wise men said, verse 7, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. Now, it turns out, sadly, Rehoboam did not choose to be that kind of king. He wanted, I guess, instead of to be a servant king, he wanted to be a powerful king. And so when, he, when the people came back, then he spoke to them, verse 13, harshly, forsaking the counsel the old men had given him, according to the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shulamite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So there are a couple things in there, right? Because Solomon had set that pattern, uh, Rehoboam followed in it, in fact, made it worse. And so um, that should give you and me both pause to think about the patterns that we are inheriting from our um, from our forebears, either our physical family or among the, the people in the group and our companies that we work in, um, what are you inheriting? Um, and so we see then, um, even though that was it was foretold by the Lord and it fulfilled prophecy, we still get the idea and the longing that Rehoboam should have been a servant king. We need, God's people need a servant king. Um, they need one who will not oppress them but, uh, but listen to them and care for them. And so um, we see then the result of that, that uh, the kingdom is divided. There's one little glimmer of hope, um, of faithfulness that Rehoboam does. Uh, he tries to take back the kingdom, 16 to 24, uh, but the Lord intervenes and says through a prophet, um, thus say the Lord, verse 24, you shall not go up and fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. So they were still 
This, even though there were two nations, this was still one family, God's family, uh, and they needed to act like a family. Uh, God has righteous expectations of how families should act together. Um, Every man returned to his home for this thing is from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord, presumably Rehoboam was in that, uh, and went home again according to the word of the Lord. So there's a little positive thing about Rehoboam. It's weak, but it's still positive that uh, there was he there was some humbling. Rehoboam had a plan, but he turned from the plan when the Lord intervened. And so going on to uh, the next section um, that's very sad in uh, 12. Uh, 25 through uh, 1420, we see Jeroboam's testing, failure, and prophesied doom. This account is very factual uh, and tragic, and there are promises that are fulfilled. The Lord said, I will make you king. I will give you 10 tribes. Um, But still, there was the same conditionality that the Lord expected what the Lord expected from Solomon. He also expected from Rehoboam. And all of the promises and blessings were contingent on covenant faithfulness, Jeroboam's covenant faithfulness with the Lord. And so we see that very quickly. Uh, verse 25, he built his kingdom. Um, and, and then in the very next verse, 26, Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If these If this people go up to offer sacrifice in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And so the king took counsel, obviously very bad counsel, um, so like Rehoboam in that way, and made two calves of gold. And so we see, like Saul, the bad king who feared um, he fe- Jeroboam feared the loss of power, and that motivated him to establish this alternate, horrible cult, just like Aaron had done. In fact, not just like Aaron, but worse. Not one golden calf, but two. And put in Bethel and Dan. Hang on, I'll show you where those are. Um, so, here, let's see here. Um... Bethel is going to be, I believe it's in this, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, I should have planned to do that. Oh, here we go. Um, so in the hill country of Ephraim, Bethel is here. Uh, Dan is up here in the north. And so uh, he put not, he didn't want them to make the, like the, there. it's about 10 miles uh, difference between uh, Bethel and Jerusalem. And so um, he is, setting up this rival worship center um, up here and up there and uh, really says, you know, convenience. I mean, that's the reason, rationality says um, to, let's see, said Jerusalem, the people, um, 28, you've gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other in Dan. And so this thing became a sin for the people went as far as Dan um, to be before one of them, one. And so this is the sinful pattern that this rival worship center, which was worship not done in the way that the Lord had intended. So even though in some ways it, it seemed like it was a little bit similar to the right worship that the Lord had established in Jerusalem, that this was an abomination. And God cares very, 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 very much how his people, that his people would worship him rightly, his way, the way he wants to be worshiped, the way he knows that is wise and good and right. And so um, into this horror, uh, both thing, this horror, uh, the Lord is still gracious and mercy merciful. Um, God loves Jer- loved Jeroboam enough to pursue him, and he gave Jeroboam three increasingly somber warnings um, through, uh, one is a, a literal word of the man of God from Judah who came and pronounced uh, a, a word against the altar, and the altar broke, there were supernatural signs, the altar broke in two, there was a problem with, you know, his hand, he stretched out his hand uh, against him, verse uh, four, and um, it was shriveled, and then uh, he had, he prayed to the man of God to heal him, and he was healed, and then, uh, so that was the first opportunity to, for Re- 
for Jeroboam to turn. It doesn't seem like that actually did anything, even though in verse 7 he says, oh, come to my house or, you know, I'll, you know, I'll give you a reward. Um, and we hear from the, in this very enigmatic section about the man of God from Judah uh, and the old prophet from Bethel, we see that um, in that section, somehow that functions as an object lesson for Jeroboam. Um, even that old prophet seems to respond rightly and uh, to, it seems perhaps, turn rightly toward the one true God. Um, but in verse 33, we see after this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but made priests for the high place again from among all the people. Um, and this, uh, and any who would, he adorned, he or, ordained to be priests of the high places. And this thing became a sin to the house of Jeroboam, so as to cut it off and to destroy it from the face of the earth. So that's the second thing. And then the, the third thing in chapter 14, um, through the sickness of Re Jeroboam's child, um, he sends his wife and receives a very severe prophetic word about uh, the demolishing of his house. Um, and uh, not only about Jeroboam's house, but also the people of Israel who followed Jeroboam's sin uh, almost universally as a corporate whole, even though there was certainly a remnant of true believers um, in the book of Kings will show us um, some of those that, uh, that he says in verse 16, um, you know, 15 and 16, the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scattered them beyond the Euphrates because they have made their ashram provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. And so we see um, in this, there's a, then this, uh, the very sad ending um, with Jeroboam's wife, who doesn't seem like she responds in a way to humble herself before the Lord. Uh, maybe she didn't believe it. I, I don't know. Um, and Jeroboam, like Solomon, is also silent before these uh, these very weighty prophecies. And so we are just told, the narrator very sparsely in um, 14, 19, and 20, that um, Jeroboam died and he was buried. And uh, But with that prophecy fulfillment pattern, now we as readers are anticipating the prophetic fulfillment of the downfall of Jeroboam's house, um, especially as Jeroboam did not, as far as the narrative uh, reveals, humble himself before the Lord and um, has set that um, horrid pattern for the nation, the northern kingdom of Israel. Um, and so in this final part of the sandwich, uh, 21 to 31, the narrator returns to David's house in Re Rehoboam. And this is a, a more stylized account, um, but again, not super great things. Um, uh, mention, and in the pattern of Solomon, um, the the fact that uh, Rehoboam's mother was an Ammonite is mentioned twice. Um, there was idolatry under his, under his reign in verses 22 and 24 that was... Um, did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And so Rehoboam did not arrest the patterns that Solomon had set. And the Lord pursued uh, in sending an adversary, the Shishak, the king of Egypt. And uh, even though Chronicles does recount that Rehoboam did humble himself in some, in, at least partially, um, this, uh, the king's narration does not. And uh, there was little, it's very removed and factual, and which is ominous for us. So uh, I think a principle that, um, with a principle I think that we can learn is that God is patient, but will not tolerate unrepentant sin forever. God is patient, but will not tolerate unrepentant sin forever. And so this is the pattern in us. Something is so twisted inside, deep on our insides, that we unceasingly, apart from God, pursue happiness, pursue flourishing apart from him. Um, we try to run ourselves on the wrong fuel, and we are prone then to reject God, pursue destruction, and we are barreling toward the day of judgment, which when God will, though he is patient, he will judge 
sin. And this is where we are apart from God's pursuing gracious work which culminates in our Lord Jesus Christ, David's true heir, the anointed one, who came into the world to do what we could not, to break all the bad patterns. And not only did he live in such a way that our hearts do long for, uh, as we read these narratives, um, he shows he is everything that the other kings lack. But rather, um, not only that, but he, and he came, as a servant king in Mark 10, 45, um, said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So he then fixed the root of our problem. He holds out to you and to me, um, and to all, not just Israelites, but any all people. Um, he holds out a solution to our perpetual problem. Um, in two ways. One, he paid the price of our sin on the cross. So we when we trust Christ, our debt to the Lord has been repaid. Um, And then number two, he promises and then begins even in this life when after we um, come to uh, believe in him, he promises to fix the twisted part in us by giving us the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do what we could not in our own sin, to help us to love and serve the Lord Um, and seek God as he intends. Um, So that is the call that's set before you and for me um, to respond in faith, uh, which breaks the pattern of looking for happiness in the wrong places. Um, Have you turned to Jesus? uh, For maybe you have not, and this is an opportunity for you to turn to him uh, for escape from the due judgment that is uh, just judgment that God has uh, for you, for you, for the sin that you personally have done and offended Him. Uh, this, this is an opportunity for you to run to Jesus and be hidden in Him, and to be created new, and to be free of that, and have new life. And maybe if uh, many of us probably have already done that for the first time, and yet there is an ongoing call. Just like Solomon illustrated, we cannot just start out great and then kind of go on autopilot and live the way we wanted to, live the way we want to. We need to keep coming to Jesus and humbling ourselves before him to be taught and trained by him. What are the ways that you are seeking happiness? Which of them are apart from the Lord and therefore doomed to fail? If you're a Christian, there are already ways that God is certainly in Christ helping you cultivate to seek happiness in Him. And thank you for joining us in this Bible study, because this is one way that the Lord is definitely doing that and showing evidence of His work. If you increasingly have a hunger for His Word and you want to hear His voice um, in in His Word through His Holy Spirit, um, if you are responding to God's rebuke, this is evidence that he has claimed you as his own. And so uh, we ask that he would continue to do that work in all of us. And uh, that when presented with our fears and our plans and our loves that are out of step with God in his way, that by Jesus, in Jesus, by his grace, we choose him. We choose the one for whom we were made and without whom we can never have life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done in us and for us uh, in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for this, uh, these chapters in Kings and ask that you would continue to teach us and grow us, dear Lord. We pray in his name. Amen. Have a great week.